So Malcolm, Rufkin, thank you very much. My for pleasure. Us. I wanted to begin with something topical, what happened on Question Time last week. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, George Galloway face a, you know, a pretty hostile uh, reception. I wonder what you thought of uh, what happened on Question Time and also to the wider question of uh, why anti-Semitism seems to be rising in the UK. Well, that's two quite separate uh, <laughs> issues. Uh, so far as Question Time is concerned, it's a television program with a studio audience. Uh, Galloway is a very provocative individual. He uh, never hesitates to be as provocative as he possibly can be, and therefore that invites a response from the audience. Some will agree with him, some will disagree with him. So I, th I think he's quite capable of looking after himself. Uh, on your second question about the uh, rise of anti-Semitism, uh, there have indeed been a substantial increase in incidents, but you know, it's quite different from the classical anti-Semitism of, the, say, the 1930s. Um, the issues that have overwhelmingly been uh, relevant to recent incidents of anti-Semitism, both in Britain and elsewhere, has been because of the controversies over Israel and Palestine. Uh, and because people feel very strongly, some people feel very pro-Israeli, some people feel very pro-Palestinian, uh, those who take the Palestinian point of view uh, assume that uh, Jews in Britain are pro-Israeli and therefore sometimes make them the uh, target of their criticism, which is pretty stupid actually when you think about it because uh, the, uh, many Jews in Britain thoroughly disapprove of the current Israeli government. They may support Israel as a country, but do not necessarily support the policies of the Israeli government. What do you make of Question Time as a show itself? Because I haven't seen I don't you I, I know you're quite right. I've been invited. To, I, I used to attend it quite a number of times when invited. I now find good reasons not to, because I think it's become theatre rather than serious political discussion. Uh, I don't, frankly, uh, like uh, programmes which have uh, a studio audience which is encouraged to be confrontational. So there's no point. I mean, it just becomes Yabu stuff. I, I don't mind being... In t interviewed as I am at the moment by someone in a very intensive way, I put on the defensive on lots of issues, that's fine, I don't mind the controversy, but when it becomes theatre, I think that's, uh, uh, and I, for exactly the same reasons, I, I'm not very impressed by Prime Minister's questions. questions. That, that's, that's, yeah, well, quite, that ceased to be serious political dialogue and has become pretty yaboo, and I, I've always been surprised that either the, the Conservative Party or the Labour Party think the public... Uh, are impressed and allow their votes to be influenced by the outcome. So who would you, what would you advise to, to young people who want to learn about politics? What show should they be watching? <laughs> well, no, it's not just a question of an individual programme. I mean, politics is a very serious business. Politics is about priorities. Politics is about how you can change the society in which you live, the various ways in which that is being done, can be done. And uh, many people who are involved in the political process are very serious people who have uh, demonstrated their ability uh, to change the world, hopefully, in a better way. As a former Foreign Secretary, I wonder, what do you make of Britain's contribution to the world over the last 20 years? Do you think the net result has been good or bad? I think the net result's been good, but I think there have been some very serious mistakes uh, that were made. Uh, the Iraq War is the obvious example that I would use, uh, as, uh, as would many other people. That was an unnecessary conflict and one we should not have been involved in. But, you know, for the most part, the United Kingdom is a country that believes in the rule of law, believes in the peaceful resolution of political disputes, uh, practices a democratic system of government. So I think the net effect of Britain's influence in the world is to be a force for good. Do you think the Chilcot inquiry will carry much weight when it's released? Well, I'm sure it will, uh, because I mean, there's a controversy at the moment because of how long it's taken to uh, publish its uh, findings. But, you know, in a historical sense, it doesn't frankly matter whether they publish it before the general election or afterwards. I mean, the, the report will be published at some time in the next few months, and uh, it sounds likely that it will be a very important and fundamental document. Now, as I'm sure you know, in the recent James Bond movie, you, yes. you do play a role, although... Uh, well, I think they... Yeah, well, quite, and... Uh, 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 as you rightly said, the, um, Judy Dench plays uh, the head of MI6, and uh, Ray Fiennes plays Mallory, who is described as the chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee, which is uh, the job I, I do. Uh, so I... Do my not getting shot. Well, my initial reaction was, why did they have to ask Ray Fiennes? I could have done it myself. <laughs> then I saw the film, and as you rightly say, he gets shot in the shoulder. <laughs> Uh, so I thought, well, perhaps they're better off with Ray Fiennes. Is your job as exciting as that in real life, or is it no, quite difficult no, no. or quite dire? No, I mean, I, I'm not part of MI6 or MI5. Or these, uh, the, the job I do is to chair a committee of members of parliament, 
uh, who supervise the work of the intelligence agencies. That's pretty important work. It's pretty stimulating. Uh, I'm not sure exciting is the right word, but it's certainly very stimulating because the issues involved are inevitably of, of great importance. Out of all of your ministerial positions, which one uh, was your favorite? Well, for my, in my own particular case, being Foreign Secretary, because when I first went into politics, into public life, quite a long time ago, uh, that's uh, the post of, of the theory. One dreamt of one day it would be marvelous if one could do that. I never expected it to happen, so when it did, that was very satisfying. And which one do you think you were most successful in? Ah, that's a different question. I don't know. No, I mean, you, in each in a role you have in public life, you achieve something, some things are disappointments. I'm not sure I single out. I mean, one of the things uh, I'm most pleased about is when I was a very junior minister, a parliamentary undersecretary, and I was uh, the minister north of the border in Scotland, taking through Mrs. Thatcher's legislation to give council tenants the right to buy their homes. And, you know, that was a social revolution. You know, instead of home ownership just being for well-off people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who were in very modest incomes had the opportunity to own their own homes. And having taken that legislation through Parliament, that made me very, very proud. So the Conservative Party recently you've held this black and white ball, as it's called. I wasn't there. Were you not? No. Were you not invited? Certainly not. Well, I think you should have been there. That's very generous uh, of you, but I'm not sure I would have wanted to go. I mean, I was looking at some of the lots that were uh, supposedly up for auction. I haven't seen the actual, but a, a statue of Margaret Thatcher went for supposedly £210,000. Holiday in Greece, £75,000. Well, I... I I'm a bit puzzled as to why anyone should have wanted to pay that sort of money for a statue of Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I preferred the real person. Do you think that uh, fundraising events like this help the Conservative Party's image in the UK? Well, all the political parties have to raise funds. I mean, we, we don't expect the taxpayer to subsidise political parties, and therefore they have to raise money in order to fight elections. And as long as it's done according to the rules and in a proper way, there's nothing wrong with that. But why is the Conservatives' budget so much bigger than Labour. I was looking at the Conservatives aim to have 19.5 million, Labour 12 million pounds. And I'm, we're kind of on the same yeah, level I'm, as well. I'm not qualified to give you a detailed answer to that. You'd have to put that to the chairman of the party. He's responsible for the organisation side. But I think for, uh, when the, the political parties are planning their uh, expenditure for a general election, uh, obviously they can only spend what they, they can raise. Uh, if, if they could raise more, they might be willing to spend more, but I'm not an expert in that territory, I'm sorry. When we look at the uh, Iranian negotiations taking place right now, uh, what do you think the outcome will be? And do you think there's anything that perhaps uh, the 5 plus 1 group should be looking to uh, ease off on? as part of the deal? Well, these are very fundamental issues. The objective is to ensure that Iran should not have nuclear weapons and be not a potential threat uh, to the, the, the Middle East. And that, that is uh, whether the negotiations will succeed. It's too early to say. Uh, there's clearly a better prospect of a deal than we've had in the past. But there is still a significant gap. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had these various delays in the uh, consideration of the, uh, of the procedure. So. Uh, I don't know what the outcome will be, it's going to be pretty close, and people will make their own judgment whether any deal is worth having, because uh, some will say it's conceded too much or achieved too little, and that's a judgment which we can only make once we know what the content of the deal might be. On to more fun questions. We were talking earlier about Prime Minister's questions, Yes. a bit of a show nowadays. Uh, it's said to be one of the most difficult things that a political leader has to do every Wednesday mm. in the House of Commons. Mm. In your time in Parliament, who made for the best Prime Minister's Questions battle? Well, you see, I'm going to answer your question because it, in some ways it shows why the, too much attention is paid to it. I mean, William Hague, when he was leader of the opposition, uh, bested Tony Blair many times, and William Hague was brilliant at Parliament, as, not as Prime Minister, as leader of the opposition, didn't have the slightest effect uh, on his uh, standing as a potential Prime Minister at that time didn't in any way damage Tony Blair, who went on to win the next election with a huge majority. So uh, I think too much importance is, is given to that. I think the Prime Minister ought to be subject to questioning, uh, and occasionally humour is a marvellous way to expose the inadequacies of a Prime Minister or to make other points. But I think sometimes these issues are incredibly exaggerated. Who makes for you the greatest parliamentarian of all time? But, uh, not very original answer, I'm afraid. Winston Churchill has to, it has to be, uh, because he uh, 
had a tiring intellect and enormous personal courage, a strong ethical position, and at the end of the day, he delivered uh, more than any parliamentarian in the last couple of hundred years. He saved this country from occupation by a foreign power. What do you make of the, the TV show going on at the moment inside the Commons? Well, I haven't actually seen it, I and mean, I've seen bits of it, but I haven't seen it properly. But uh, I think for anyone who's not a member of Parliament, it would be fascinating seeing things as it were a bird's eye view. Uh, m- m- the small parts that I have actually seen uh, are, are similar to what one sees if one's in the chamber or in the building uh, as a member of Parliament. So I think it's a very useful way of showing in a more effective way how, how the Parliament proceeds. And how has politics changed as a whole? from when you first entered until now? Oh, I think the effect of television has made a huge difference because when I, I first entered Parliament in 1974, and uh, of course at that time the cameras weren't there, uh, so inevitably if, if the cameras are in the chamber, uh, that influences the way people behave. Uh, I don't think you can exclude them. I mean, in the modern world, television is fundamental to our way of life, and that's absolutely right and proper. Uh, looking at the TV debates which will be coming up, do you think it's right to allow some of these minor parties to join if not all of them will be joining up? Well, you have to have some sort of rules and you have to have some sort of cut-off point. I mean, normally if a party, maybe a small party, but if it has elected members of parliament, then it has uh, entitlements which flow from that. How you do that is quite a technical issue because otherwise it can be very boring from the public's point of view if they have very large numbers of party leaders all appearing in the same programme. So you've got to get the balance right. If I had a magic wand, then I can make you Prime Minister. No, thank I, you. I don't, unfortunately. But if I no. did, who would you have in your cabinet? Who do you think was the best Chancellor, the best Foreign Secretary? Uh, I'm not going to speculate on that because it, 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 it I mean, I can give you lots of names, but there'd be names from history and it, it would oh, be... Names from history are fine with me. I, I know, I know, but... Um, uh, you, you have a whole, I mean, Ernest Bevan was one of the great foreign secretaries. I haven't seen, he was a Labour MP. A uh, bit difficult to put in a Conservative <laughs> cabinet. Uh, the chances of the Exchequer, some are brilliant, some are fortunate in being Chancellor when their country's the economy is doing well. You've got to make judgments of that kind. So, what was your funniest, your best moment in Parliament or in government? Uh, give us a good Margaret Thatcher story. Uh, well, I can remember being with Margaret Thatcher on one occasion, and uh, somebody asked her whether she believed in consensus, and we all knew she didn't believe in consensus, but to our surprise she said, uh, yes, I do. And then she went on to say, uh, there should be a consensus behind my conviction. <laughs> I'm not sure she was joking at the time. So would you say it was far more exciting working under Margaret Thatcher than it was to John Major? Well, I don't think you judge these things by excitement. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was a very strong personality. I got on very well with John Major. He was a very good Prime Minister, a very impressive, very thoughtful, very bright guy. Uh, but he had a quieter temperament. Uh, so, whereas Margaret Thatcher liked to test people. And we had a sort of series of explosions on a sort of bilateral basis, not just with me, with all her colleagues. But she didn't mind that. You, if you fought back, she, she enjoyed that. And, uh, she was a very impressive person to work for. Who has been your, I know this, you might not be able to answer this, but who's been your favourite Labour Prime Minister throughout history? Throughout history? Good Lord, that's an awful long time. Um, there haven't been all that many. No, there, there, there haven't, and hopefully there won't be too many more either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the Labour Prime Minister who has the best reputation is Clement Attlee, because although he was a, a very strained, very quiet sort of person in terms of his temperament, he presided over a very radical government and uh, is certainly seen by most Labour members of Parliament as the one they're most proud of. Your son, Hugo Rifkin, is obviously yes. a uh, well-known journalist at the Times. Mm. I wonder, do you argue with him much on political issues? As a teenager, would he rebel against your decisions? Uh, well, he, uh, he had no desire to be a politician. Uh, he thinks we're all mad, as he has once <laughs> memorably said. But he takes a great interest in political issues and quite often writes about them. And we're, we're very close. We often exchange views and do lots of things of that kind. So um, uh, he's, he's his own person, and I'm very proud of him. What advice would you give to people who want to enter politics? What's the first step that they should be Well, it's a question of temperament. It's not just a question of ability. Um, you have to have... I mean, most careers you might choose, 
uh, you can assume that as your career progresses you will be promoted, you will earn more, you will reach whatever level your colleagues think and remain there till you retire. Uh, politics is not like that. Politics is snakes and ladders. You know, I was foreign secretary one day and I was unemployed the next. Uh, and some people may go through the whole of their <coughs> public life and not get the opportunity to serve as a minister because their party might not win an election or even if it does win an election the prime minister might prefer somebody else. So, you have to have a temperament that can live with that level of uncertainty. What type of music do you listen to, Sanat? What's on your iPod at home? Well, very much classical music. I mean, and a fairly late entry. When I say late entry, I mean, I didn't grow up terribly interested in music, any kind of music, to be honest. And I can't sing for toffee. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> hopeless of that. I have performed in opera. This is not well known. Really? Yes. That's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. When I was a student at Edinburgh University... Is there a film of this? Well, no, <laughs> thank God, no. no uh, when I was a student at Edinburgh University, the Prague National Opera Company came to perform Dalibor by Schmetner at the Edinburgh Festival. <clears throat> they brought their singing cast, but uh, in order to save money, they did not bring the non-singing spear carriers. And I was recruited as one as a student, as one of half dozen spear carriers. So I have performed in opera, even though I never opened my mouth. Final question, and it's a question we ask all of our interviews. Muhammad Ali once said that a man who views the world at 50, as he did when he was 20, has wasted 30 years of his life. Uh, I wonder, how do you view the world differently now to when you were 20? Oh, I think you realize that it's that marvelous Rudyard Kipling uh, uh, poem, if you can treat with triumph and disaster and, and, and treat these two myths of being the same. You know, in other words, now they get terribly excited when things go well or terribly upset when things go badly, they all tend to sort themselves out eventually. That's a wonderful answer. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you.